Leon Panetta 2020 Lecture Series. Decision 2020, a republic if we can keep it. This lecture discusses impeachment and the election. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sylvia Panetta. Good evening, everybody. How wonderful to see you. Mike, there we go. Is that all right? Great, thank you. It's great to see you. Many familiar faces and even some new faces. Thank you for being here. We're, this begins our season 23 years now that we have been having the lecture series. And tonight, it is with the greatest pleasure that I welcome you to the first lecture, I have to put my glasses on, of the 2020 Leon Panetta Lecture Series. As I said, 23 years now that Leon and I have been putting together this lecture series. We've done so because we believe that there is a need in our communities for balanced and thoughtful discussions about the policy changes we face as a nation. I can honestly say that this mission has never felt more important than it does right now. As Americans, we all benefit from the foresight and bravery shown by our founders in the creation of our republic. However, we must also be aware that our democracy is fragile. Today, the institutions of our democracy are being tested. The nation is deeply polarized by issues like immigration, trade, environmental policies, health care, and social issues. Washington is divided to the point of dysfunction, leading to serious concerns about the effectiveness of our system of checks and balances. This year's theme reflects the vulnerabilities of our democracy and our own responsibility as members of this republic. This season, we'll look ahead to the 2020 election and consider Decision 2020, a republic if we can keep it. While Leon and I are both concerned by the threats facing our union, we're also confident that the promise of our republic remains strong because of the tenacity of the American spirit. It is the spirit that brought you all here tonight, and it is the spirit that has supported this lecture series for more than two decades. Your presence and your interest shows a dedication to the re respectful exchange of ideas a commitment to the concept that solutions can be found through discussion and through the consideration of all points of view. Most importantly, it celebrates the belief that a diversity of opinions makes a richer discourse. These are the types of discussions we bring to the stage during the Leon Panetta Lecture Series. And it is our hope that it is conversations like these and the insight they provide that will guide us all as we prepare to vote in the upcoming elections. Thank you for joining us and for all your support. Now tonight, we'll reflect on impeachment and the election. Wary of a president who might abuse that office, our founders established the impeachment process. To ensure that the process wasn't overused, they made the passage of impeachment very difficult. Our nation experienced this reality earlier this month. Now that the verdict has been rendered, what are the lessons for our system of government, for the balance of power, and for oversight? Are elections the only way we hold presidents accountable? How will President Trump now approach the major domestic and foreign policy issues he faces. Most importantly, how will the legacy of impeachment impact the presidential contest and the decisions of voters? Leon will pose these questions to some of the most respected political journalists working today. 
Now let's talk about our guests. Our first guest is the host of one of the nation's top-rated cable news programs. He began his career in television journalism, working at stations in Raleigh, North Carolina, Rockford, Illinois, and Beaufort, South Carolina. He was named Fox's Southeastern Correspondent in 1998 and went on to serve as the network's National Security Correspondent and Chief White House Correspondent. Today, he is Fox News Channel Chief Political Anchor and the anchor of Special Report with Brett Baer. During the 2012 political season, he served as co-anchor of America's Election HQ and provided extensive election coverage, anchoring presidential and vice presidential debates, the Republican and Democratic conventions, and moderating five Republican presidential primary debates. He interviewed all of the 2016 presidential candidates as well as President Donald Trump. Vice President Michael Pence, former Presidents Barack Obama and George W. Bush, and former Vice President Dick Cheney. Please welcome Brett Baer. Our second guest is one of the most high-profile political journalists working today. She is the national political correspondent for National Public Radio and a contributor to Fox News Channel. She joined NPR in 1985 as a general assignment reporter and newscaster. As part of her work, she has covered Congress and served as the White House correspondent during all eight years of the Clinton administration. Now, as the national political correspondent, her reports can be heard on the award-winning news magazines, All Things Considered and Morning Edition. During her tenure, she has covered all the presidential elections since 1992, and she reports on Senate and House races every election year. She's an expert on elections, on national policy, and on relations between the White House and Congress. She joined Fox in 1997 and serves as a panelist on Special Report with Brett Baer and Fox News Sunday. So please welcome Mara Lyason. Our final guest has a career in journalism spanning three decades and includes nearly 20 years at NBC News. He served six years as the moderator of Meet the Press and was chief White House correspondent during the entire presidency of George W. Bush. He contributed anchoring duties to all the network's major programs, including Today and Nightly News, and served as a political analyst. He traveled with President Bush on 9-11 and was with him during his first visit to Ground Zero. From the White House, he covered the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, earning a reputation as the toughest questioner in the press corps. At Meet the Press, he scored a string of exclusive interviews, including an interview with Vice President Joe Biden. During the 2012 campaign, he moderated a, de a debate among the Republican candidates and conducted interviews with numerous foreign heads of state and was a key player in election night coverage spanning four presidential cycles. He president, presently serves as a political analyst on CNN as well as a visiting professor at Georgetown University. Please welcome David Gregory. Now moderating our discussion is the man who created this lecture series, a former United States representative for this district, Jimmy's father. <laughs> Director of the Office of Management and Budget, Chief of Staff for Bill Clinton, Director of the CIA, and Secretary of Defense. 
He has a very deep understanding of elections, a deep understanding of politics, and he knows the importance of our republic. So please welcome Leon Panetta. Thank you very much, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, to this year's series of the Panetta Lectures. Uh, as Sylvia pointed out, this is our 23rd season. And I was looking back at uh, the first theme that we had back in 1997, which was governing our democracy into the 21st century. Uh, who would have thought that 23 years later we would be talking about whether or not our democracy would survive? Uh, and that's what, we, that's what we're talking about, uh, a republic, if we can keep it. John Adams, who was not known for a great sense of humor, <laughs> said there never was a democracy that did not commit suicide. As much as we love our country, we can't take it for granted. And I think one of the great dangers in our democracy today is the danger of complacency. We are deeply polarized, more polarized than I think I've ever seen our country. We are politically dysfunctional in terms of the inability of Washington, President, Congress, to deal with major issues facing this country. And the parties spend a great deal of time not only attacking themselves, but attacking each other. And it kind of pushes us to a point where we just want to turn off the noise. But we cannot turn off the responsibility to be good citizens and to care about where our country is going. What happened with impeachment and what will happen in the coming election will not only test the candidates and leaders of this country, but in many ways it will test all of us and it will test our Constitution. We, the people, have to decide the direction of our country, not the Russians, not the talking heads, not uh, those who use Twitter, not social media. We, the people, have to decide the direction of our country. And by virtue of the fact that you are here tonight, I think it tells me that you care about the issues that are affecting our country and you care about making that very important decision. I've got a chance to talk with about all of these issues with a great panel here of speakers. And let me, let me begin by raising the whole issue related to impeachment. Our framers put impeachment into the Constitution as a check on the President of the United States. But they also made it very difficult to get a conviction for impeachment by requiring a two-thirds vote of the United States Senate. We've had four presidents that have faced some element of impeachment. None have been convicted, which tells us a lot about the bar you've got to cross in order to be able to be impeached. So the question I have for our panel is, how do we then hold a president accountable? If impeachment is tough to accomplish, especially with the kind of divided politics we have today, and if presidents can't be indicted for crimes based on the Justice Department memo, if a president does something wrong, uh, abuses his power in some way, then 
if a president cannot be above the law, how do we hold that president accountable today? Brett? Well, first of all, uh, it's a real honor to be here. And it, you all are very, um, I think, blessed to have a guy like Secretary Panetta uh, bringing all of these folks into this area to talk about big issues, as he's done for 23 years. Um, to answer your question, I think uh, it takes a bipartisan effort to hold a president accountable. And that is not what happened this time. And the only bipartisan thing that happened was that the impeachment vote went forward. And the bipartisan part was that two Democrats voted with Republicans against impeachment. I think that the case could have been made, but it was not, they did not use the courts. They did not challenge some of the pushback on the subpoenas and the people and the documents who were not provided. Had they done that, it may have changed the dynamic. Censure was an option. It didn't materialize. I think some Republicans may have voted for censure to say what happened was wrong, but we don't think it rises to the level of kicking the president out of office. And I also think it was a high bar because this is an election year. And people thought, wait, I mean, if I don't like it, I can wait nine months and let the voters decide whether this president should be in office or not. So I think it's still there. I think the courts may have been one of the options that wasn't used. Mara? Yeah, I think that um, impeachment is a high bar. It's hard to accomplish. I agree with Brett. Having it, making it happen in an election year is even harder because every Republican had a safe place to land, a very legitimate argument. Why don't I let my voters exercise the most sacred right in a democracy to cast their ballot and decide for themselves if a president should stay in office or not? I have thought a lot about why censure wasn't taken. You know, a lot of people wondered whether Nancy Pelosi could land the impeachment plane somewhere other than on the Senate tarmac, where everyone knew it was going to crash and burn. There was never any question that the president was going to be acquitted. But one of the um, things about impeachment is it's the most serious investigation a con Congress can undertake. So the Article I branch is at the height of its powers in an impeachment inquiry, and that gave its subpoenas extra weight. I don't know if they would have gotten the people to come and testify before them who did if it was just a regular congressional hearing. But civil servants, former diplomats, you know, did come forward. Um, but I do think, in retrospect, censure would have focused the narrative around what the president did, not on the process and whether or not he should be removed. And it would have forced Republicans to go on the record saying whether they think what the president did was right or wrong, not whether it's the right time too close to an election for him to be removed. And just as a final thought, where the American public was on this, and they really haven't changed, is that Polls showed that huge majorities, like 75% of people, thought what the president did was wrong. But when they were asked, should he be removed because of it now, nine months before Election Day, then public opinion was either split almost half and half nationally. In the battleground states, it was tilted a little bit more towards the president. So you know, the public was never overwhelmingly for removal, nor was there a big backlash against impeachment. You also have this unique circumstance where you have a president who said, I did it. Yeah, I did what they said I did, and it was fine. You know, that's different from, say, the Nixon impeachment, where there was an investigation that actually uncovered things that were going on that they didn't want us to know about. Uh, here, the president said, yeah, yeah, it happened. I didn't actually do the things that I was talking about doing, but, uh, but even so, there was nothing wrong with it. When you have somebody who really operates outside of that, uh, you know, kind of conventional political sphere, I think it gets hard. I think that's where responsible members of the political bureaucracy have to speak up and stand up for their institutions, where the press has to do its job. But I worry about a process of impeachment that becomes a statement rather than an outcome. So that if we're in the business of making the statement of impeachment, it will be used. It will be used against Democrats in the future. And then we're going to continue to devalue it. This is one of the problems with our modern media landscape that includes social media, is that you know, we're, we're cheapening our outrage. Because you know, we're outraged if, like, 
over so little, you know, if we don't find the, the kind of kale we like at the supermarket, you know, we're outraged. So, you know, everything is such an outrage that, uh, that we're losing our ability to really focus on the big important stuff. Yeah, if everything's an 11, yeah. then nothing's an 11. Right. Yeah. And one other thing about the Founding Fathers, you know, there's a lot of talk about the Founding Fathers about impeachment, but Alexander Hamilton did write about a concern that it would become a political process that would be used against another party again and again and again. And that was one of the concerns they had. Do you ever notice that the Founding Fathers are invoked for basically everything? Everything. On all sides. Like the Houston Astros invoked <laughs> the Founding Fathers to say that the drum beating was okay. I mean, it's yeah. just weird. Yeah. No, no. They're paying the price today. <laughs> That's right. Uh, you talk, you, you mentioned censure, uh, Mara, and, uh, you know, there is a question, why did they not seriously consider the possibility of a censure, knowing full well yeah. that the Senate was not going to approve uh, the impeachment. But in many ways, what I think is now happening, and I'm, I'm worried about this, is that because, I mean, I, the, speaker, the speaker said Trump is impeached forever, despite the fact that uh, the Senate did not convict him. Uh, I'm just wondering if impeachment by the House uh, without a Senate conviction then becomes a new form of censure in the country. Yeah, I think it does. It's the, it's the practical equivalent of a censure because it doesn't end in removal and there was never any question that it would end in removal. Look, Nancy Pelosi wants, when she says impeachment is forever, she wants to make the House's message permanent. But the Senate sent a different message. The Senate sent a message, depending on who you were listening to, Lamar Alexander, what the president did was wrong but not impeachable. You could listen to other senators who thought it was perfectly fine that he did this. It was just a big witch hunt to go after him. So the Senate sent a very different message. And the president took away, as everyone knew he would, the message he took away was everything I did was fine. As he said in the past, Article 2 of the Constitution allows me to do whatever I want. What all those members of the Senate who hoped that he would, quote, learn a lesson, you know, I think the lesson is that he is emboldened and now looking to clean house for all the people who he feels did him wrong. You know, the, the, the political implications are really minimal. It's yes. kind of a wash, and we knew yeah. this right away as it was happening when Democratic candidates were on the campaign trail for the presidency, and they were not talking about it. Yeah. They were not being asked about impeachment. They didn't really hit it hard, and frankly, it just didn't move the needle. And I don't think that there's going to be retribution for either Democrats who voted for it or Republicans who voted against right. it. And the, the members but, who have gone on the political issue. Yeah. 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 The problem we're left with in, in with the end of all of this is, you know, it's one thing to say we shouldn't criminalize political differences, but we, we're, we're so living in the land of subjectivity and different perspectives, we can't get at anything real. You know, there's nobody who in real life will say that what he did was appropriate. Um, so the question is, so what, what, are we, what are you supposed to do with that? What are you supposed to do about that? The test will be if Hillary Clinton were president and she did that, I mean, I guarantee you she would have been oh, impeached like yeah. you know, three weeks from yesterday. Yeah. So if there's some consistency around people saying wrong but not impeachable, fine. But the, so that's the question. What do you do about it? What do you do to check that? And I go back. I mean, again, I think a bureaucracy, as this case, brought it up. I think the press tries to do its, its job. But in, the, in this environment, it gets kind of to Brett's point earlier, a lot of the problem that some Republicans I talked to said, look, maybe you could have looked at some kind of censure or other kind of remediation against Trump uh, about Ukraine had it not been on the heels of the Mueller investigation. 100%. Which, which a lot of these Republicans felt like enough already. You know, Democrats going after him. And I think that's also reflective of their, of their voters. So let me ask you, uh, you know, kind of looking back at it, what will, what will history say about what we've just been through? Uh, Andrew Johnson uh, was acquitted by one vote. Uh, I think the comment was that that one vote was uh, kind of a profile in courage uh, because of it. Uh, Nixon uh, was forced to resign. Uh, Clinton lied about a sexual affair. He was acquitted and apologized. Uh, and now President Trump uh, tried to get the president of the Ukraine to investigate a political opponent uh, and held up military aid. But he, too, was acquitted and did not apologize. 
What will history say about this impeachment? Was it failed leadership? Was it an unfair trial? Or was it just a reflection of the politics of the time? Depends on who's writing the history. <laughs> I mean, really. I'm going to let you write yeah. it. For I mean, <laughs> 20 years from now, you know, who will be in power and how will they be interpreting this? Um, we know that uh, Donald Trump thinks about his legacy. Um, you know, he cares about how he's seen uh, in history. That's one of the reasons he wants to make it clear uh, in his mind that Russia did not help him at all. Um, but I don't, it depends on who's writing well, the history. I, I take a stab at it this way. I think that, um, you know, the, you know, the Johnson impeachment, those were wild days, I can tell you. <laughs> how that. But, you know, that was reflective of a time where this was a bad guy who was trying to reverse, um, you know, the progress that was made through the Civil War and who was a, a, a racist and a segregationist. And there was a sense of the politics kind of striking back at him and penalizing him. You could argue that the visceral dislike that Republicans had for Bill Clinton really fueled um, you know, that attempt to delegitimize him and drive him from power, if that was the vehicle for other things that he had done. right? I think that's what's similar about Trump here, is that there's such dislike for him. It's so visceral. I think that you'll look back and say it's the politics of the time that there were, that there were Democrats who wanted him impeached from, the very, from day one. And that's a big piece of it. I think Nixon stands aside because there were such you know, real crimes there that were committed that history judges that on its own. But I do think that's where the context of the politics of, of the times uh, will judge this, this period. And I think there was a decision to be made by Democrats, and that was, do we speed this up? because we want to get it over with before the Iowa caucuses and the New Hampshire primary. And that really was the calculation. We want to get it shelved. We want to put it behind us, even if we know that the Senate is going to vote against, they're going to vote to, to acquit. So it became this speed thing, like, let's get it done. Now, they, they justified it by saying the urgency was that he's going to affect the next election. But then they waited three and a half weeks before moving forward with the trial. It was just, there was a disconnect there. And if they really wanted to make the case and really thought they had it, they should have gone through the courts and fought all these And I'd say one other, I think they it. want to demonstrate, Brett, that they can play hardball like Republicans. Look at the handling of the Garland nomination where Mitch McConnell said, no, in an election year, we ought to punt and we ought to wait till there's a new president. Then he was asked, well, what if there was a chance to nominate in 2020? He said, oh, we confirm him. I mean, it was very clear what he was doing. Democrats, I asked him that last week. Sorry? That was, it was me. you who asked that? Yeah. I, I just wanted I, to make sure. No, I knew I liked you. Yeah, okay. I knew I just, <laughs> you, I get into the gave, heart of the matter. You, you, you gave you, David you. a line. <laughs> no, but, but, but I think that, um, you know, d Democrats feel like they're behind Republicans, that they'd never really succeed at playing hardball. And I think part of this was that they knew their base demanded impeachment, even though it wasn't going to reach removal. And to your point, they, were, they did it. They could then put it on the shelf and try not to have it be a distraction. But, but, you know, the thing about this is Democrats went into impeachment. Don't forget, Nancy Pelosi had her finger in the dike for months. She was not going to allow impeachment to go forward over the Mueller investigation. Right. She stopped that. It was only when seven of her moderate members, majority makers, people who'd flipped red districts blue, most of them ex-CIA or ex-military right. national security officials, came forward to say, if this is true, if the allegations are true, that he actually asked a foreign government to investigate his political rival, we should have an Im impeachment inquiries. And some of them even said, I'd be willing to lose my job over this because the Democrats were never confident of the politics of this. They didn't think this is a slam dunk for us. We're going to impeach him and, and then his numbers will go way down. They were nervous every step of the way. One of the reasons I think that they rushed and didn't take it through the courts to their detriment was because um, they weren't sure of the politics. They wanted to get it over with. And they, and they guessed correctly, I think, that once it's in the rearview mirror, it's like just almost like it didn't happen. Minus you asking this question, it really has not come up. Yeah. Yeah. And it really hasn't come up for yeah. the public consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we as a country haven't yeah. really talked about it post-impeachment that yeah. much. Yeah. Right? The people, the, the women who signed that op-ed in the Washington Post who forced Nancy Pelosi's hands, one of them was Alyssa Slotkin. She went back to her district recently. We had a reporter there. 
you know, maybe there was one person in the town meeting with a sign up that said, boo on you for impeaching, five people saying thank you, Alyssa. That was it. No questions. Let me ask her of it. Let me, let me ask, uh, kind of wrapping this up, about what it does to the balance of powers. I mean, if you, if you look at the Dershowitz uh, defense, uh, which a lot of scholars don't agree with, uh, under Article 2, if it's not a crime, a president can pretty much do whatever he believes is in the nation's interest, uh, which is a pretty broad standard. Uh, our forefathers developed three separate but equal branches of government in order to make sure that power would never be centralized uh, in a king or a king parliament or a star chamber court. Uh, now it's pretty clear, I mean, the president pretty much uh, said, I'm not going to cooperate in any way with oversight in the investigation. Uh, the Congress wasn't able to really do much about it. Uh, the courts operate slowly. Uh, is the fact today that the presidency has become more powerful? Uh, and what are the implications for our democracy? I mean, I think the presidency has become more powerful, but maybe Congress has become less yeah. powerful. Yeah. In other words, they haven't stepped up in that yeah. role. Uh, there are a number of examples where Congress could have come back. Earlier you mentioned um, the, the uh, authorization of use of military force, which is the same one that we passed after 9-11. It's still intact, and we haven't gone back and said, let's redo this. Uh, it takes leadership in Congress to press an executive. And without that, there's a vacuum, and the vacuum is filled by a strong executive who is always going to fight for executive power. There's no doubt that, that over time, this is just the latest incident, Congress has been ceding power to the executive. You know, we, people talk about congressional overreach. It's actually a problem of congressional underreach. Uh, they don't want to pass appropriations bills. They don't want to deal with tough questions about using military force, so they let the executive decide. But what's really interesting, a lot of issues around this separation of powers battle were left unresolved because they didn't go to court because the judicial the, the third branch of government the judicial branch never finally ruled on who was right for instance when they issued when the house issued a subpoena to John Bolton's deputy Charlie Kupperman he took the house and the white house to court he wanted to force the issue and then a couple of weeks later the House re, re, they dropped re, dro took back the subpoena because they didn't want to risk losing. In other words, that was a, that was a risk to go to court because maybe the co court would have ruled for the, for the executive. So that's, you know, that's something that remains to be seen. But I would make a prediction. You know when the, the powers of Congress will be restored and the executive will be diminished? When Liz Cheney is the Speaker of the House and there's a Democratic president. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. Yeah, you heard it here first. This is a male-female <laughs> thing. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just quickly on this, I do, th I do think it's the unique nature of the president we have who's willing to demonize opponents, who's willing to demonize elements of the government in a way we've not seen other presidents do, certainly not since Nixon. Um, and he does it with levers of power that have not been available before, which is the ability to whip up his own base of support through social media and, and, um, and have other people who are on cable news to amplify that message as well, who can, uh, you know, who can you know, create a narrative about the deep state and so distrust in our institutions, given that there's already so much distrust in our institutions. So there has to be... Uh, a clawing back. I, I think the judiciary has done a good job kind of standing on its own, and there are limits even to what President Trump can do. He has not had massive movements of legislation, for example, beyond his tax cuts. He couldn't do that in turning back Obamacare. So, you know, there are limits, and that's where the legislative branch can, uh, can uh, show some muscle. But what he's got is a lock over his party, uh, and, you know, and, and, and some you know, presidents have that under the right conditions, especially, again, this, I do think it's a unique circumstance of a major special prosecutor investigation followed up by, by, uh, by this. Let me ask you about the role of the free press. Uh, how would you grade the role of the press? You're all in the press and you follow this issue. How would you grade the role of the press in handling impeachment? Was it fair and objective? Did it try to influence the process? Uh, how was it impacted by social media? Uh, tell me what you thought about 
how the press handled it? I think yes, yes, and a lot. I mean, in other words, I think there was a lot of good journalism. I think there was, uh, you know, there was some entrepreneurial reporting about the process, about um, what was happening, what people were thinking. I think there was fair and objective reporting, and then I think there was elements as well that were um, clearly cheerleading uh, for the process uh, and who were um, really against the president. And I think social media is a... Um, amplifies all of this and creates a kind of context of outrage for this that doesn't allow for you to sit with something and wrestle with it. Whether you're a lawmaker or whether you're a citizen, I mean, I think this was especially true, not just impeachment, but I think um, uh, Kavanaugh was such a good example. I remember complimenting Brett on his and his colleagues' coverage because my wife represented Kavanaugh, so I was, I had to withdraw myself from that. But I think a lot of people in the media, in Kavanaugh, as well as impeachment, didn't allow you to kind of sit with, okay, well, I have some mixed feelings about this. Can I work this through? You had to be on one side or the other. And again, that's elements of social media and cable media, particularly in prime time. I separate that out from some of the very good, um, you know, uh, other coverage that's done about, you know, your daily news coverage. Laura? Yeah, I think, look, the press isn't one monolithic thing. So it's hard to say how we did as a big blob. But I think that, um, you know, one NPR, other news organizations, Fox did. We carried a lot of it live. People, you know, this is a historic, you know, a, a, a episode. People could watch it. There was some gripping testimony. There were civil servants and diplomats who came forward. There were um, contentious uh, back and forth in the committees. Uh, speeches on the House floor. I think that we pretty much let the process just play out, and um, that was, I think, the best thing that we could have done. Yeah, I would say overall a B. Uh, we collectively aired a lot of it gavel gavel, mm -hmm. with not no commentary. Yeah. And when when a channel that is very successful gives up its airwaves and its commercials for gavel to gavel coverage of an impeachment, I think that that says something about the importance of the moment yeah. and the history. Uh, the reason I give it a B is because there were some stories that were not right, and some of it had sometimes feels like it has an element of emotion about hatred to the president. All I'm saying is you can be that way, you just have to be fair. And um, so I think overall pretty decent. All right, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the election uh, and what's going on now. Uh, State of the Democrats, uh, which is uh, obviously uh, pretty, uh, pretty concerning for Democrats. Uh, no, no problems there. Yeah. Uh, are we looking at, at, in some ways, a repeat of what happened in 2016, when uh, when Trump won? Uh, he had a number of candidates who were also running, but for some reason they couldn't get their act together and really present an alternative yeah. to Trump, and he was yeah. able to get ahead. Uh, is, what, is that what, what is happening with the Democrats? So we've got, uh, obviously, uh, Sanders. Uh, we've got uh, Elizabeth Warren. We've got the moderates, Biden, uh, Mayor Pete, Globeshar, the billionaires, Bloom, Bloomberg and Steyer. Uh, and it, are the Democrats in a situation where because of these splits and the inability to put it together that uh, we're looking at uh, a party that could be badly split going into November. Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen this movie before. And the Democrats know, the Republicans had a failure of imagination in 2016. They really thought that if they lay down and took two aspirin when they woke up, Donald Trump would be gone. And he wasn't. They just couldn't believe that he was going to be the nominee. This is different. Democrats understand full well the clear path that Bernie Sanders has to the nomination. But maybe because they're human beings who are ambitious, they, the center-left candidates can't seem, even though they all agree that it would be better if there would be one alternative to Sanders, it's like the prisoner's dilemma, you know, a collective action problem. They can't, a neat, no individual one of them wants to be the first one to drop out and say, we should all rally around, you know, X person. And they're not going to do it. And as long as the field is split, yes, I think uh, uh, that 
it could be exactly like 2016. The difference is the Democrats have much more at stake because most Democratic elected officials think that Bernie Sanders would not just lose to Trump, but he would pull down the party and maybe cost them the majority in the House, which is right now the only check on the president. So the stakes are very, very high, but unless they get their act together literally in the next week or two, I don't really see how, how you stop Sanders. Uh, Secretary Panetta, I'll just say that there's a few filing deadlines that are still open. <laughs> so... <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. I'm not playing to the home crowd, but I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, I, I do think that the billionaires and the millionaires <laughs> and Medicare for all, I, I do think that you're heading down a road where it's going to be the left populists versus the right populists. And uh, I, I don't see a, a way that the others uh, get out of the way. I mean, because, first of all, Mayor Bloomberg was this this thing that when the Las Vegas debate happens, everybody's eyes were attracted to it, like this is going to be the guy. And then suddenly it was like the Wizard of Oz, where they pulled back the curtain and it's like, just a wait, little this guy. is the guy? Just a little this guy. This is the guy? This is not the guy yeah. in the ads. Yeah, yeah. Where's this guy? Yeah. And, you know, for all the money and the millions and millions of yeah. dollars, I think Hundreds he could have spent a, a few more dollars on the debate <laughs> prep guy. <laughs> um, I think South Carolina is going to be interesting. I think Biden could potentially win South Carolina, which then creates its own issue. Biden is not a great candidate. He's been off his game in some of these debates, and he's, you know, is he going to be the guy that galvanizes the moderate lane? I don't see it. 38% of delegates will be decided by Super Tuesday. After Super Tuesday, you have 70%, but that's going to be split among a lot of pe yeah. people. So you, the most likely thing that happens is that Bernie Sanders goes into Milwaukee with a plurality of the delegates, not the magic number, but a plurality. And at what point does Milwaukee and the party say, you know what, you're not our guy? But Last I just... time, B Bernie said a plurality wasn't good enough for Hillary. Remember, he said she had to have a majority. He'll, he'll this have time, a, diff he likes he'll have a different position going yeah, into yeah, Milwaukee. Yeah. David. I just think the bigger issue here is, is worth thinking about. You know, I think it was really important that we stood back and say, well, why did Donald Trump happen as a political phenomenon? Why did that happen in, in this country? Um, and uh, there were lots of reasons for that. And now on the Democratic side, you know, why is Bernie Sanders the front runner? It doesn't come out of nowhere. It's actually, as Brett said, it's very similar to why Donald Trump happened. It's a sense that that these political parties are not working for us, that, that political systems are not delivering, that major institutions are falling short, and that somehow we're not really reaching our potential as a society because of these entrenched um, inequalities that are holding people back. And so th there is this tension right now within the Democratic Party, and it's playing out because Sanders is this kind of outsized figure with democratic socialism between, oh, no, 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 we just have to stay unified. Let's just stay unified. It's just the, whoever can beat Trump, that's the thing. That's all we really care about. And he and Elizabeth Warren are saying, no, the way you beat Trump is you're bold enough to take on uh, conservatism and take on what's wrong with capitalism and what's wrong with our political system. That's what people will respond to. That's actually how you do it. And there's a big fight about that, about what the future of the Democratic Party is, what the future of capitalism is. These are real you know, debates that are going to be had. And so the Mike Bloombergs don't do himself any service when he kind of dismisses it and says socialism is, oh, we tried that, nobody wants that anymore. That's not true. There's lots of people who want to hear, like, what's wrong with socialism? Uh, and so... I don't know how I don't know how that's going to play out, but there is room for someone who comes in and says we got this all wrong, let's go about it differently. And Donald Trump showed that you could do that and actually prevail. But to Mara's yeah. point, you know, if the economy is cooking, if if people feel relatively good about where they are. Now, I'm not saying across the board, and I know the, the point is, is that the economy has to hit all sectors of our population, but for the most part, you feel good about where the economy is. 
It is really hard to believe that the suburban voter, yeah, yeah. the soccer mom, yeah. the, the somebody in suburbs of Philadelphia is going to go, you know what? I'm going with the Democratic Socialist. Yeah, I want to nationalize, like, the private health insurance industry. So I get yeah. what you're saying, and that is maybe how he motivates the, the base, yeah. but I'm not sure that the upside, that, that yeah. that's a winner. Yeah, but what could happen between now and then, if he has to be successful in doing it, is he has to be able to cast democratic socialism in a way that is not as menacing. But he's not trying, and he hasn't yeah. changed his tune since 1971. But, but look, the other thing, that the, the, there's a, also another explanation. Bernie Sanders is where he is because Joe Biden could not perform. Joe Biden was leading in the polls. The idea of Joe Biden was, was, a, was a leader. A People, strong Joe Biden yes, is very... Yes. The, the, the concept of Joe Biden was appealing to most Democrats. He had experience. He had kind of working class cred. He could appeal to the Rust Belt states, et cetera, et cetera. But he could not perform. Mike Bloomberg was the next idea that came down the pike. Remember, the votes for the center-left candidates altogether are much bigger than the votes for Bernie Sanders. Right, but what do you mean perform? Perform where? Perform as a well, candidate. Joe I, Biden... Well, maybe, maybe there's just not support. Maybe we thought there Joe was Biden all this support. Joe Biden has been a terrible candidate. And I, I don't disagree, but that's what I'm saying. Like, he didn't perform. He hasn't performed well in the debates, but I, I think you're saying... He hasn't performed well on the stump. Right, that's my point, is oh. that, that maybe yes, what maybe the point. fallacy is that there was the support that we thought was actually there for him. Maybe it's just not there. Well, for, once they for saw him. him in person, that's what I'm saying. There was support for the idea of Joe Biden when they took a look at him, when he encountered an actual voter in right. Iowa. Then, well, guess what? You know, the, but the voters are encountering well, Bernie Sanders, and they're voting for him. I don't think this is an ideological... Uh, yes, I don't uh, think this is what they Let me take charge of this for a minute. Uh, and I want to I want to ask a question yeah. and so, uh, to make sure the Republicans don't get off the hook here yeah. as well. Uh, first of all, uh, this is our uh, halfway point, and I'd like to take a moment to recognize our question review team, the people responsible for selecting the questions that will be presented to our speakers. So if you would hold your applause, let me introduce the entire group. They are Chelsea Adami, who's a local news editor with Salinas, California, Fran Gaver, or veteran question review team member, David Kellogg, managing editor of the Monterey Herald, Doug McKnight, reporter for KAZU Radio, and Sarah Rubin, editor for the Monterey County Weekly. If you would thank them, please. We also... I should, I should hold my applause until the actual question. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> we also have... Um, with us a, a group of students who represented those who attended the afternoon student program. We had a great turnout, uh, almost, uh, well, we had over 500 students who were here for the student program. That's great. Uh, representing all of the schools in the area, plus the military installations. Uh, and at this time, what I'd like to do is to ask all of the students in the uh, audience to please stand, and please remain standing till I recognize each of the schools. They, there are eight schools represented tonight. CSU Monterey Bay, Soledad High School, the Defense Language Institute, Middlebury Institute for International Studies, Monterey Peninsula College, the Navy Postgraduate School, Santa Clara University School of Law, and the University of California, Santa Cruz. Thank you all, Doug. The student program uh, was great. Uh, the students asked a lot of tough questions, and it was, uh, it was great to get their, their input because they are our future. Uh, the student program is possible because of the generous support of our lecture series sponsors, and Sylvia and I, along with the Panetta Institute uh, Board of Directors, very grateful for the sponsorship that allows these students from high schools and colleges and universities, military installations, from across the Central Coast, from Northern California, uh, they, their support is what makes that program possible. So please give our sponsors a hand, would you? <laughs> All right, let's talk about the state of the Republicans. Uh, you know, there's, there's a little question that uh, the Republican Party is now the party of Trump. But Republicans also used to stand for things, uh, for fiscal responsibility, uh, for controlling the debt, for balanced budgets. 
for strong world leadership, for the importance of alliances, for free trade, for law and order, for less government. And a lot of those positions uh, are not exactly uh, what uh, Trump has strongly advocated. Uh, there is now very strong loyalty to uh, Trump, regardless of what he does. Uh, are the Republicans making the right decision by putting all of their chips on Trump, win or lose? And considering the demographic changes that are taking place in this country, will it cost the Republican Party the future? Oh, is that? <laughs> well, where's that going? I mean, I, I think Short that. Short term, um, yes. Short term, good. Bad term, long term, bad. Well, I think the long term trend is still bad demographically for the Republican Party. They did the that autopsy report after Mitt Romney lost that showed, among other things, that if they don't reach out to more people of color in this country, they're not going to survive as a party. Trump showed something different that he could tap into a lot of people's fears who feel left behind in some fashion and actually uh, and unearth more voters, more Republican voters. He combined that populism with kind of tried and true conservatism about, uh, about social issues, embrace of evangelicals, and the courts, above all else, the courts, the, the, the control of uh, the future of the Supreme Court. And it's so motivating to core particularly social conservative voters, he was able to bring all of them uh, together. I, I think he's been pretty adept at, you know, you know, if you look at the business class in this country, whether it's less regulation or uh, tax cuts, corporate tax cuts in particular, uh, and then his general position toward the press and his opposition, I think that there's, uh, you know, that there's a lot of support there. So I, I, my, my question is really the f future of conservatism. Because I don't know that, it, you know, I think Barack Obama was kind of a singular sensation on the left. Um, and that's one of the problems that the Democrats have. I think that's true with Trump. I don't know how you replicate him, but there's some, so my question is about the future of conservatism and of, of his brand of populism in someone else. I don't know. So I think that uh, Republicans, uh, some of them who have uh, been tried and true conservatives on a number of the issues you mentioned, uh, look at President Trump. Uh, and see the canvas that they want to see. In other words, they look at the justices and judges and they say, this is a great thing from my perspective as a conservative. They look at less regulation. They look at the tax structure. They look at, uh, you know, the efforts that are being made uh, for businesses to change the environmental um, situation. And then they look at, on, so there's two sheets of the paper. One is the list of those things. And then the other side of the paper is the tweets and the, you know, uh, kind of going after people and, you know, what he says day to day, the horse face and the, you know, all the other stuff. So there's two sheets of the paper. And uh, I think that depending on how Democrats finally get their nominee. Uh, will depend on how independents and conservative Republicans look at those two sheets of paper. And they'll focus on this side if it's Bernie Sanders, and they'll, foc they'll look kind of at different sides depending on who it is. Mara? Yeah. Um, everything, you know, it's funny. Every single thing we talk about now has, we can talk about it in one way, then we can talk about it if Bernie is the nominee. It kind of changes everything. I mean, if Bernie Sanders is the nominee, Donald Trump and the Republicans have an, the opportunity of the century to reach out to the middle, which he has so far completely refused to do. Most presidents try to expand their coalition. Donald Trump took what some people call a cable news business model, which is doesn't matter how many people are watching you so long as they're tuned to you 24-7. In other words, he just wanted to, to intensify his base, get them more and more energetic, try to find other people who are just like their, his base demographically, and get them to turn out for him. But he wasn't interested in expanding his coalition. But Bernie Sanders will give him an opportunity to do that. He, Bernie Sanders could be the best thing that could happen to the Republican Party because without him, they are facing some long-term demographic problems. But I will um, say the yeah. judicial reform yeah. and the efforts he's made recently to reach yeah. out to African-American yeah. communities, I think, is a signal Mm -hmm. that they are trying to shave two, three, four yeah, okay. points. Well, Bernie will help Democrats them do that and maybe even more. Constituencies. Yeah. yeah. 
All right, let's turn to the uh, questions from the audience. Um, Let's start with uh, this one. When de Tocqueville visited the United States, he was impressed by the level of debate by informed citizens of every class. The founders thought this sort of debate was necessary for a republic. How did we lose that, and how do we get it back? Well, well I always say this. One way we get it back is by having K-12 through civics education, where people would learn how to have an argument without demonizing their opponents or thinking that they are traitors and treasonous just because they disagree with them. I mean, having a, a, a civil discourse where you agree on a set of facts and then explain why you have two very different opinions about what to do about those facts is something that's an important, it's kind of like a, like a dem, little d democratic muscle that has to be exercised, otherwise it atrophies and we just start shouting at each other and nothing ever gets done. I think social media has has uh, played to the extremes, and social media, you know, really adds to that that level of uh, of bad discourse. There are a few groups out there that are making headway. Uh, one is called Listen First, and that is to listen first to your opponents, even if you're diametrically opposed ideologically, to just listen to the argument and make your argument, but be civil about it and. Uh, it really is, it takes a lot of teaching to our kids to start that because adults on social media, you can just look at my Twitter feed and I, I'm happy to provide evidence to. Yeah. Um, I would just add, I mean, I think the responsibility is ours. I think we can begin in our, in our own social interactions when we go out to dinner with friends and family. How can we model having a discussion where you, you, you don't have to avoid a discussion about politics because it's so fraught between you? Um, you know, if you're getting a lot of your news from stuff that, you know, friends and family send you on Facebook, challenge yourself to read something or watch something that you disagree with and start to identify people from different points of view who have a point. That, that it's what Secretary Panetta talked about. We have to be able to listen to each other. We have to demonstrate how to break out of our own information silos if we're going to get much traction because if we don't do that, then we get locked in. You know, it's very easy to delegitimize people you don't know. You know, you think about someone who might be accused of uh, sexual predation in some way or sexual harassment. And if it's somebody that you know, you know, you're willing to say, gosh, this person should be, should get a fair process. I don't believe this is true. Like, you know, you're, there's just more humanity. But if it's this distant figure in Washington, you're like, oh, totally wrong, probably, a, you know, a, a rapist. Let's you know, oppose that person. So we need a little bit more uh, kind of up close and personal um, connection to avoid that proclivity to delegitimize other views. Okay, uh, this one uh, deals with, uh, you know, Russian uh, interference in our election. Uh, from the media's uh, introspective from 2016, uh, are you ready to be more careful about not dispensing uh, Russian disinformation to the public? That's a great question. I wish some of us were work for Twitter or Google or Facebook yeah. because that's right. where the real problem is. I, I promise don't think not to spend any, spread any more. Yeah, yeah I don't think, you know, yeah, that's, that's, that's that. really a question for the social media companies because, you know, the problem is, is that the business model of social media, the algorithms, tend to promote extreme content because that's what keeps you online longer so they can sell more ads. It's kind of the only conspiracy you'll find online is the one to keep you online looking for conspiracies. Um, so that's, it's a real problem. Um, I, I don't know if the media can report on false information without spreading it further, um, but the this, this social media companies are really have to step up. Yeah, I look at my job as a news anchor to be in part an ice hockey goalie to try to prevent the bad pucks from getting through. And there are a lot of bad pucks out there with uh, everything that's out there. And, and it's increasing in technological effort. Uh, these things called deep fakes are actually videos of a politician speaking, but it's not that person. And suddenly it pops up, and you think it's a soundbite from some event, yeah. but it's not. It's, it's a Russian or Chinese or Israeli. As the Secretary knows, there's a lot of different countries that are looking to sow chaos in our election process. Um, so 
I think we have a responsibility to, to do our job and to be the ice hockey goalie, but you all also have a responsibility to kind of, this doesn't make sense, yeah. right. you know, maybe I should look at something else. That's the hardest part is I think it's less important what the news media does in that respect than what is being consumed yeah. generally that are these deep fakes or manipulated videos. So I think we have to try to balance. The problem is you just don't know. I mean, what a lot of this disinformation is pushing on open doors where we're already having these debates with each other and then kind of going down that alley and, and, uh, and producing more. I think that's where the government's got to got to play a role in trying to uh, regulate this as well, which they haven't been very good at doing. You know, in a low trust society, if you don't trust the media and you don't trust the government, who do you trust? You trust your Facebook friends group. <laughs> that's where you find out that Barack Obama was not born in the United States, or vaccines cause autism, right. or Hillary Clinton was running a pedophilia ring from a ch pizza parlor in D.C. I mean, you know, it's it's a problem. Yeah, yeah I mean. I, you know, as uh, having been in the intelligence business, uh, the purpose of intelligence is to speak truth to power. Uh, you don't need an intelligence service uh, if you don't want to hear the truth. Uh, and very frankly, the truth and facts are incredibly important to leaders like the president being able to make the right decisions. Otherwise, they're operating on fantasy uh, and you're likely to get the wrong decisions. Uh, it, the intelligence services have all said what the, the Russians are doing, uh, and uh, we, we know that uh, that's a fact. Uh, give me a sense of why, why does the president resist uh, being able to kind of stand up and say the Russians are doing this and we're going to make clear to the Russians that uh, they're not going to get away with it? You know, his people say that. You know, You're Secretary right. Pompeo says that. Yeah. Um, his national security advisor says that. Um, he, I think, feels under siege um, and feels like any indication that Russia somehow helped him but diminishes his yeah. electoral yeah. Yeah. win in 2016 or diminishes his win if he wins in 2020. You know, the story about the other day, um, about this briefing up on Capitol Hill, I mean, there were, it was nuanced. It wasn't as cut and dry as people, like, shorthanded it. Essentially, the president found out that there was this briefing to the Intelligence Committee on Capitol Hill, the Democrats run by Adam Schiff, who had just been an impeachment manager making this case on the Senate floor, uh, and he was briefed, and they were briefed about this before the president was briefed, is what I understand. Yeah, that was, and, that was a mistake. And yeah. that right there, I think, builds this thing in the president's mind that he's under siege. And, and at some point, there's some element of truth to that. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting is that the intelligence community has, this isn't the first time we've heard this. I mean, they, they said, after 2016, we think the Russians will do it again. We've, they've said periodically, we I think mean, that the was Russians not news, are still right? trying. Yeah, so it wasn't news. Um, you know, Mueller cataloged what they were trying to do. Um, and it's really, it's interesting. Bernie Sanders, who, of course, you know, took umbrage at this and said he doesn't want any Russian help and, you know, he's no friend of Putin, blah, blah, blah. One of the things that, that you have seen happen after the president got mad about not being briefed first is that now the White House is saying the Russians want to help Bernie, not us. So, but isn't it weird yeah. that Bernie Sanders didn't say anything for a month oh, and a half yeah. Yeah. Look, after getting there briefed? So I mean, many, what's that? What's that? And he was asked about it. Why did you wait a month? And he said, um, uh, I don't like to talk about classified briefings or something like that. And then someone said, asked him, why do you think it broke just now? And the Washington Post says they ran the story when they got the story. But uh, Bernie said, well, why do you think it broke on the day of the Nevada caucuses? It's from the Washington Post. They're not my friends. Or he said, good friends. It was a very kind of... In other of, words, yeah, they're fake news. Yeah, they're fake news. It was very Trumpian. Uh, right. You know, he didn't say enemy of the people, but he did, or human scum. But, you know, he did, <laughs> he did lash out at the, at the message. Okay, tr Trump and the leading Democratic candidates are both farther right and farther left than where the two parties used to stand generally. Are candidates on the extreme outside of the party the new norm? Does that mean the primary system is broken? 
How will these sorts of candidates and primaries affect governance in America? A lot of questions. That's a really good question. So I, I said earlier to, yeah. there was a similar question earlier with the kids, and they were really great questions. By yeah. They were really good. But I said that the traditional system is that for Democrats, uh, you know, they go to Iowa, and it's very progressive, super progressive. And they go to New Hampshire, it's a little bit more libertarian, but very progressive. They go to South Carolina, it's about the Black Caucus. They go to Nevada, it's about uh, kind of open immigration. Republicans go to Iowa, it's about social conservatives. They go to New Hampshire, you cannot tax a thing. You go to South Carolina, it's about the military, all the military. And you go to Nevada, and it's about build the wall. Now, on those two parties, in the first four states, they are drawn to their extremes to fire up the base in the primary and caucus system. Traditionally, it has been that in a general election, they come back to the middle and they play for the middle. But less and less, yeah. that's happening less I, and less. I believe the primary system on the Democratic side will be changed. I think the Nevada Democratic Party actually came out with a statement saying we're ready to move to a primary. We don't want to have a caucus. There, there are two issues here. One is should they be the first four states that go first, Iowa that's 91 percent white, New Hampshire that's 93 percent white, and then there's the issue of the caucuses in Iowa and Nevada. A caucus is not a secret ballot. Um, a caucus uh, makes it harder, for, since at least in Iowa you have to go and stand there for several hours, makes it harder for women with children to go. There's all sorts of issues. After the debacle in Iowa, I think there's a tremendous amount of pressure in the Democratic Party to change the way they start off their primary, their nominating process. What exactly will happen? Will they have a bunch of states go first on the same day? Uh, will they have a, a bigger states go first? I don't know, but I do think uh, we've come to the end of, at least on the Democratic side, of this current current but, system. But the front part of that question is about whether the parties are moving, and I think the parties are moving. Yes. I certainly think the Democratic Party has moved left. I mean, it's, you know, the notion that even with the primary structure, you know, Bernie Sanders had a huge voter mobilization among Latino voters, which helped him tremendously in Nevada. He's pulling up to Biden in polling with African-American voters in South Carolina. So, you know, it may just be that he is. Nobody wants to hear this yet, but I just want to let the voters speak. He may be the more mainstream part of the party in terms of who actually shows up and votes if he can get a bigger coalition. The notion that on health care alone, the movement from 2008 to 2020 in the Democratic Party shows you that uh, that would have been, what would have been judged extreme taxation as well. Uh, is much more mainstream in the Democratic Party. I interviewed yeah. President Obama a week before uh, Obamacare passed in the House. And one of the questions was, is this, the Affordable Care Act, the camel's nose under the tent for essentially government-run health care? Well, it's no longer the camel's nose. The whole camel is in the tent. He's just in there. Uh, because Medicare for All is essentially everything. It's a total evolution from where 2010 was. Uh, for the Democratic Party. On the Republican Party, there is an abandonment of concern about deficit and debt. Remember that Paul Ryan, as vice presidential nominee, and Mitt Romney, as Republican nominee, campaigned in front of a debt clock. Yeah. They campaigned in front of the debt clock. They warned about they it. They warned debt, about debt it. Remember crisis. the commercials where Paul Ryan's pushing the, the wheelchair over the cliff? And, you know, they said, what are you going to do to grandma? That's because Republicans thought that that was a real issue that people cared about. Donald Trump said, no, we're going to grow our way through this. And at some point, you have to turn the aircraft carrier. And I know I've covered you talking about this ad nauseum, uh, both Republicans and Democrats concerned about it. Yeah. It's you got to do something yeah, well, at some point. Well, wait till yeah, the next no, recession I mean, I, when I, we have no fiscal I, policy. The biggest concern I have yeah. now is that Republicans and Democrats yes. don't want to talk right. about the debt or the deficit. Yeah. We've got a deficit of a tr over a trillion dollars. We've got a debt of over twenty-four trillion dollars. Yeah. So how are you going to pay for sixty trillion yeah. for Bernie can, Sanders' can, program? Exactly. Right. Can I say what, exactly. one thing about mand a mandatory mm -hmm. Medicare for all? Because that's the Bernie program. Medicare for all is very vague. When people hear Medicare for all, they think, "Hey, I can have Medicare if I want it." That's not what Bernie's plan is. That's his plan is mandatory Medicare, no more private health insurance, and it's Medicare for everyone. Now. Polls show, and, and David is right, something like 6 in 10 of voters in Nevada in exit polls said they were for Medicare for all. Then 
they were asked some follow-up questions. And when they found out there would be no more private health insurance, nope, I don't want that. So, so there's a lot of confusion about where the public is on health care. They want drug prices to come down. They want, many of them, want to be able to buy Medicare if that's what they want. But remember, people don't like big changes in their health care system. That's why in 2010 and 2014, the Democrats did so badly in the midterms because Obamacare was on the ballot. It was only after Obamacare went into action, went into um, existence and Republicans tried to take it away that the tables were turned and the Republicans suffered in 2018 because of health care. Here, here comes Bernie Sanders to coming to take away the best issue that Democrats had for them in 2018, right. health care, and he's going to give it to the Republicans. The one thing we should say that, you know, we can be very substantive, but these things may never come to pass. But I think is important in a politics of anger at an angry time is that that candidate with fight, it's like what they, you know, when FDR was president and people were discouraged about the, about the uh, depression and whatnot, they still had great faith that he was there. And in a politics of anger, the idea that Trump is willing to, to fight and demonize, uh, they like the fight. And I think people like that about Bernie Sanders as well. well. They're not thinking about whether this is ever going to come to pass, but that he's willing to make the fight. Well, wait, explain Elizabeth Warren. She was Miss Fight, Fight, Fight. Well, I... <laughs> I mean, that's what yeah. she said a hundred times in every stump speech. Yeah, right. well, she lost me, to the let me Bernie the, Sanders the fighter. Let me move on to this question. Uh, Congress's uh, inability to work together in a bipartisan uh, legislative uh, effort uh, has increased. Uh, do you think that setting term limits on Congress would help create more opportunities for innovative leaders? Let, let me just add to that. I, I think the reality is that whether it's Trump or whether it's Sanders, you know, even if it's a, a moderate Democrat, they're going to have a hell of a time governing, uh, particularly with a divided Congress. And how are we going to avoid uh, another four years of gridlock? Uh, because the likelihood is that Bernie's program is not going to wind up being adopted uh, by the House or the Senate. Uh, and so, you know, he'll be stuck like, uh, uh, like Trump has been stuck, and he's going to turn to executive orders and, and talking and pounding a shoe on the table. How do we get Washington back to governing and working together in order to uh, deal with the issues facing this country? I, I'm not a bit, I mean, I don't know that term limits is the answer. I, I think it's, because I, I think part of the problem is that it, it, it's become you know, a dirty business to legislate and to work with your colleagues and to hang out in Washington <laughs> and to, you know, you know, have a have a kid who plays Little League and then you talk on the on the outskirts of the game. You know, now it's sleeping in cots in your office because you want to so openly show your disdain for the institution. I think we have to change the incentive structure. You should want you know, a Leon, a, a Leon Panetta, Jimmy Panetta, to go to Washington to go and work with his colleagues, uh, Democrats and Republicans, to actually get things done for your communities back home. And I think that's what's been lost. So, and I think, again, there's aspects of the media that disincentivize that, but I don't know that you want experienced people. I mean, to all of a sudden yank somebody out just as they're getting the hang of the thing, I don't think that's the answer. Yeah, I think that. Um if you listed all the things that Democrats and Republicans agree on on Capitol Hill, it's actually a long list. They get to some point and then they go to their corners because there's some issue that happens and, right. and they can't politically get to what they really do agree on. To your point earlier, infrastructure, I mean, infrastructure should happen. It should be a bipartisan thing. Yeah. Uh, I wrote a book about Eisenhower. It's called Three Days in January. Dwight Eisenhower's <laughs> final mission. Available on Amazon. <laughs> Three Days at the Brink's about FDR. It's also available on Amazon. No. <laughs> uh, but, but Eisenhower was our most bipartisan president. He worked with Sam Rayburn in the House and Lyndon Johnson in the Senate and did some really big things, including the national highway system that we drive on today. Um, and we just don't have many Eisenhowers out there. You know, we could use a few more. The two most popular governors in America right now, just by approval ratings, are Larry Hogan and Charlie Baker. 
Republican governors of blue states, Maryland and Massachusetts. That tells you that as people want the two parties to work together. Now, they do keep on voting for people who go to Washington and don't work together, but I think voters like it when people work across the aisle. And I'm not sure that a Donald Trump in a second term, and I don't know this for a fact, wouldn't try to get big things done because it's about his legacy. In other words, infrastructure or who knows, maybe immigration or something big that has his name on it. Um, I don't think it's going to be Simpson Bowles. But, no, um, certainly not. And I deficit think so. death, but uh, I think there might be an effort to do something big. There's a lot of focus on the strength and uh, executive branch versus the legislative. But is the high turnover in the cabinet reducing the effectiveness of the executive branch? Of this executive branch, yes. yes. Yeah, the executive writ large, maybe not. But yeah, this executive branch, yeah, there's so many empty positions. And what happens if we have a pandemic? And right. yeah, there's. That's actually what yeah. scares me the most. I mean, yeah. about the, the, this president, it, his impulsiveness. And the fact that I just don't believe he has the best people around him. And I think, you know, you know, we covered, when you, covering the ins and outs of the Iraq war, one of the things that where there was a real breakdown, and people in the Bush administration will tell you, is a very dry sounding term, the interagency process. But that's what really matters. It's how agencies that are, who are tasked with implementing these policies, how they actually do. So wh whether it's responding to, um, uh, a viral contagion like uh, coronavirus or uh, financial contagion you know you want good people there and you you need to listen to those people that's the breakdown I worry about right now well but I mean it's pretty obvious that uh, President Trump doesn't want strong people around him yes right I mean yeah, yeah I, I mean I think the, the loudest you know voices in the cabinet have not have not stuck around um, General Kelly obviously was trying to uh, really lock things down. I, I will say there's turnover in other administrations. There were a few defense secretaries in the Obama administration. But nothing at this After level. Me. After you. <laughs> After you. Um, but I think that nothing like this, yeah. nothing like these numbers. Yeah. And I think that, um, frankly, this president uh, runs it how he <laughs> wants to run it. And. Uh, We'll see. I think that the, is there a big voice in that in that White House? Mick Mulvaney is not, not that voice. Not now. Mick Mulvaney, who gave a speech in England, re Oxford, recently, saying that this country is desperate for immigrants. We need as many of them as we can get. And he said the quiet part out loud. He said Republicans only care about deficits when there's a Democratic president. Right. No, it's it's very much you know it's very much this the outside said, voice. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. what the president wants done. Now your job is to figure out you know how you get it done, as opposed to speaking truth to power and managing again. You know the intelligence community has lots of problems and has over the years, but to have a complete breakdown there, where you say, oh, I just can't trust these people because they're out to get me, and then the bureaucracy of justice is out to get me. I mean, it it really is paranoid. I mean, he's had a few people that stayed the whole time. Steve Mnuchin has been Treasury Secretary yeah. since the beginning. Wilbur Ross at Commerce. There's a few people that have been since, since the beginning, but uh, there are very few, and it's really, really turned over quite a bit. Uh, uh, Brett, let me ask you something. Uh, I, I asked this uh, in an earlier session. Uh, here's President Trump, and uh, he's just gone through the process with the Mueller report, and it's pretty clear that at the end of the Mueller investigation, he's not going to be impeached. Uh, Congress doesn't have uh, the steam to, to really do that. And Pelosi basically decides that uh, you know, she's not going to get anywhere on that. The day after Mueller testifies, uh, the President of the United States picks up the phone, calls the President of the Ukraine, and asks him to investigate uh, a political opponent. Uh, I mean, I, if, as chief of staff, when a president makes a mistake, what you try to do is to make damn sure that that president never makes that mistake again, and that you're going to say, don't do that. But clearly, that didn't happen here. Uh, what was, was Trump not thinking about that? Was he just 
thinking there's nothing wrong here for me to do that or that I can get away with it. I mean, what, what motivates him to do that so soon to uh, <laughs> the investigation, the, the Mueller investigation? Why, Brett, why? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that book's available on Amazon. <laughs> uh, listen, I think that the biggest issues for this administration, for this president, are things that he has caused himself. Uh, the biggest storm that has created are from things that he shot himself in the foot. Yeah. He creates the storm, then figures out a way uh, to get out of it, and gets out of it, and says, see, I got out of this storm, but the beginning storm was because of something that happened of what he did. Now, I think it's, uh, that's just who he is. It's how I think he ran some of his business. I think, you know, it's that kind of thought process. I don't know that there's a lot of people in that White House that have the ability to say, you know, don't do that. Uh, I think maybe the, maybe Ivanka has that? I don't know, but I, I mean, don't know. The, the thought that Donald <laughs> Trump would say, see some polling on Joe Biden, very good feeling, you know, worried about Joe Biden, and he thinks, you know, he's thinking about all this stuff about Ukraine, this and that. He Maybe Rudy Giuliani gave him the idea. You know, let's get the Ukrainians to say they're opening an investigation. That would really, you know, undermine Joe Biden. That sounds like a good idea. I don't know if it ever enters Trump's head. Is that the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? Or is that something that, you know, I mean, I don't know if that ever enters his head. I think he's very focused on, on winning and doing whatever it takes to win. And I think after Mueller, he had to have felt emboldened. It wasn't just that the Mueller report did not, uh, well, they certainly weren't going to indict him because they thought that he couldn't be indicted. But the Mueller report, you know, gave him what he considered to be, you know, a full exoneration. It wasn't just that. It was that Bob Mueller was on television the day before and did badly on television. Right. I mean, you can't discount that. He, remember, he gave a halting performance. And performing on TV is the kind of metric for Donald Trump. You know, Bob Mueller, the guy who tortured him for, for two years, looked like, you know, he was an old fuddy-duddy on television. And so maybe but Trump I, is just I, feeling I full of votes. I think his persona across his life, his public life, in the tabloids as a real estate developer, someone who, when he was facing bankruptcy, told banks to take a walk. If you live your life and in a personal fashion without limits, um, and without boundaries, and that's worked for you, um, you're going to bring that into the sphere, especially because there's all of this reinforcement for no limits, no boundaries. He gets reinforced by that in the political realm. He's not going to listen to the gatekeepers who say, no, presidents aren't supposed to act like this, because he says, exactly. Because even when he looks bad in the media or otherwise, it all feeds the persona that has generally been rewarded because he was elected president of the United States. And I think it feeds into all of that, Secretary Panetta. I think that call to Ukraine, I think he gets motivated by the idea that there are real scandals that the press and that his opponents won't get to the bottom of and that he, he operates by loyalty and vengeance and he wants to get to the bottom of it. I will say that he figures out how to get to a W, how to get to a win, whether it's in his mind or it's in the population's mind. But right now, as we sit here today, he's at 50 percent approval in Gallup. He's at the highest approval on the economy that we've seen. This is after the impeachment that we just went through. This is after two years of Russia that we just went through, the investigation. He is in a position to win re-election. And, you know, it's interesting to watch uh, the cycle. And what happens is he does something that really f throws people off and they're like, how can this possibly be happening? And then the media says, this is unbelievable. And then there's outrage about it. And then there's pointing to the outrage. Can you believe they're getting this upset about this? And then it's full circle. And then on the other side, he says, you know, it's all fake news. It's the press. They're after me. And then people go, you've just, well, yeah. You've just described his life history. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this. We've, we've gone full, trans we, we used to have full transparency on health and taxes uh, for a president. Uh, and now we have a president who doesn't want to disclose his taxes or his health information. And now Bernie Sanders is pretty much doing the same. Uh, if a president has 
a bad heart uh, or physical problem, shouldn't the public be entitled to that information? Absolutely. Sure. So Absolutely. And, and the thing that's amazing is that, you know, Bernie Sanders is, I don't want to say he's like Trump ideologically, of course he's not, but he has done a lot of Trumpian things. He said he would release his medical records and now, nope, he's not going to. And uh, <laughs> Donald Trump said famously over and over again he was going to release his tax returns. That's not going to happen. There's no law that says you have to. And it was a norm that all presidents did, but that norm has been broken. Yeah, and I think that's the that's the age we're really living in. We're, we see it. We see it in our communities. I mean, you know, uh, whether it's you know how out of fashion calling an adult Mr. or Mrs. You know, or or uh, you know other things that we considered norms of public behavior by the politicians and other public figures has been undermined by Dave, all of the things. David, that let me just stop you. We got uh, about a minute and a half. Okay. I just want to quickly. Uh, Who's going to win the November election? <laughs> Very quickly. It's hard to make predictions, especially Dave, about the future, but you'd have to say at this point it looks like Trump. Yeah, like, I think Trump wins. Yeah. Really. How about Brett? If it's Bernie. So I do candidate casino, $100 in chips. I'd say $70 on Trump, $30 yeah. on Bernie. Yeah, that's good. Uh, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, let's all go out and get a drink. Uh, <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for being here. Uh, I, I think we do face a lot of challenges, but I put my greatest trust in you, the people, to make the right decision. And if you do that, uh, I'm absolutely confident that we will protect the republic that all of us love. Thank you very much for having us this evening.